I want to welcome you all to uh, my little talk about replacing traditional backup systems with ZFS. Uh, my name is Calvin Hendricks Parker, and I work for a company in Indiana called Six Feet Up. Uh, we have been around since 1999, which is kind of crazy to say out loud because it means next year is our 20th year in business, which is crazy. Uh, but the whole time has been on FreeBSD. Uh, I'm a longtime FreeBSD user. I've been using it since 1996 and has kept our company safe, our data safe. And I want to talk about some of the journey that we have done uh, over the years you know, through various backup systems and how we have backed up our data. Uh, basically, since 1999, we've run a cage and or rack or hosts data for others someplace, so we have to keep that data safe. Um, and we've been successfully restoring customer mistakes you know, ever since then. Oh yeah, we are definitely an anomaly. Uh, uh, we are a woman-owned business. Uh, this is the CEO right here. Uh, also my wife. Um, she's a very wonderful person. I have to say that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we've, we've done a good job of, of trying to be a, a diverse uh, company. Um, so if you're, looking, actually, if you're looking for a job, we are hiring. Uh, looking for a developer right now. Uh, so I think the key to all this is backups will be done when it is easy. Uh, has said probably every system in, in the world. Uh, and more importantly, like simple. I think easy probably should be taken out of my vocabulary. I know that my sysadmins cringe whenever I use that word. So it should be considered a bad word, and we really, really should make sure that backups are as simple to accomplish as possible, because then they'll be done on a regular basis. So a little bit of backstory of where we have been with backups. Um, we started right from year one uh, with backups, like any good company should, even a small company like ours. We're only 16 people right now. When we first started, it was just actually my wife Gabrielle uh, in 1999 and so I started with Amanda as a backup system uh, from 99 to 2012. We did a little bit of Bacula in 2007 as a proof of concept and then dove fully in on Bacula in, uh, in 2012. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those systems. Has anyone in the room been using Amanda? <laughs> yeah, this is like, yeah, Amanda is, it's I guess the old oh, home. The old, the old standard, right, of uh, backup systems and open source. Uh, if you've not used it, it is pretty awesome because it is very easy to use. Um, some of the things I really loved about it, I mean, it's, it's written in C and Perl. Uh, it has a BSD style and GPL license. It is uh, currently backed and supported by a commercial entity, so there is people actively working on it. Um, I would recommend it to people because it is still a good backup system. It was my first backup system I ever used uh, for a different job before I started our company. Uh, they had Amanda in-house. It was a visual effects company, and so they had you know, tons and tons of data to back up for all the various movies that they were working on, so it was really important to them. And one of the things I really liked about it is due to, to native tool use, usage uh, in Amanda, we were able to do things like uh, recover from a very painful experience when one of our sysadmins accidentally deleted the index directory of Amanda. So Amanda has an index it maintains. But if you lose that, you're not actually dead in the water. Uh, you just use tar and dump and, and you're on your way. I mean, it was painful, but we didn't lose any. There was no data loss, which was nice. So Amanda did a good job of, uh, <coughs> of protecting our data uh, through the years, which is why we held on to it and used it for so long. But I think, you know, as with any first love, uh, there's issues that kind of caused us to, to go looking, you know, our wandering eye maybe. Uh, we stopped using Amanda due to the age of our current packages we had installed. So we were on FreeBSD and as things kind of kept moving, uh, the upgrade from Amanda 2 to Amanda 3 uh, ran into, it was kind of rough. There was lots of uh, renamings, uh, UIDs and permissions, and there were various timeouts and random hangs. So we had a real hard migration trying to go from two to three. So basically at that point we decided we needed to look for something that would be more stable and could grow with our organization. Uh, another issue was that Amanda, at the time, Amanda wasn't, didn't support ZFS very well. And so we were very excited about using ZFS right from the beginning. I think since FreeBSD, it was available on eight, and we started using it like right away, even before it was kind of the standard thing you would even use as a file system on, on FreeBSD. And because of that, Amanda didn't work well with it to begin with. Uh, and Amanda also would commonly, one of the problems we would run into is it would commonly bring down some machines if you had rather large backups. So if you don't know, if you know much about Amanda, but it'll spool up a lot of data into temporary directories. So if it was short on disk space, uh, you could guarantee bringing a machine down with Amanda uh, trying to back it up, which is unfortunate. 
And feel free to ask questions along the way about any of our experiences with these tools. Uh, the next one I actually looked at was Bacula. Oh, well, actually, we did use. We kind of proof of concepted it and there for about a year. And then when we finally got all those troubles with Amanda built up, we basically said we had to make a change and move into Bacula. Uh, actually, Dan was probably one of the reasons I went to Bacula because of all his great posts on the FreeBSD diary about using Bacula. So I had a great guide uh, to get us you know, into a good spot with uh, Bacula. So Bacula's file system level backup. Uh, it used to be a GPL v2, and I don't think, think things improved by moving to the AGPL v3, or you can get a proprietary license. And I'll go into that a little more, a little more later. I, I think this should have been telling uh, right off the bat. Uh, when you come to the Bacula website, uh, they don't necessarily encourage you to use Bacula uh, right away. Uh, <laughs> this is right on the front page. Because Bacula is not a simple system. I mean, as you kind of saw in this, uh, this is actually a, like an architecture diagram of how Bacula works on this screen right here. And there are lots and lots and lots of moving parts to Bacula. Uh, so if you are not used to lots and lots of moving parts, or if you just have a very simple set of needs, Bacula is definitely not the choice for you. Now, we were, we did have an infrastructure of a, a, good, a, a good enough size, I think, it deemed worthy of Bacula. And actually, Bacula has served us very, very well. Again, restoring customer mistakes since 1999, and Bacula has helped us you know, recover from many of them. But there's not, not without, Bacula has not been without some drama. Uh, maybe not the drama like we saw earlier, but uh, there's definitely been some I don't know, friction with the Bacula community and the Bacula creator and uh, the, what he called the hidden cost of creating open source. Uh, so Bacula moved to an open core model. So there's an enterprise version of it, which gives you the proprietary license. And one of the promises that they made was to uh, any feature they included in Bacula Enterprise within some amount of time, would, a maximum of five year delay, would land then in the Bacula open source product. That hasn't always happened. Uh, for example, one of the main things we would like to have had in Bacula would be block level. Uh, backups, which is included in their open source uh, version 5.1, which was released in 2011, and is still not actually in the open source version uh, as of today. Uh, so that I just this is kind of a bad example of open core gone wrong, and so I'm not a big fan of that. I definitely want to have more of an open source, flexible solution where I feel like it's kind of a partnership between me and the community who's you know, producing the open source software. So beyond the political issues of Bacula, I mean, Bacula is a very good product, uh, but I think maybe we had some issues with the, um, our, our use cases for how we backed up our data and the kind of workloads we were backing up specifically. Uh, one of the problems that we've run into is Bacula is, because of the very various moving parts, there's lots of configurations. Uh, I'll show you some examples of how we improved upon that, uh, but there's many, many configurations that at some point our configs got so bad and so unmaintained that we were basically down to having a once a week backup of all of our stuff because it was things have just gotten out of whack. Now, Bacula does require a database, so there's many moving parts. Uh, so the database is there to index the files that all get backed up, which is nice when going to restore because it's very fast to like get listings and find the files you need to restore. And in that case, you know, Bacula is very very nice. But it takes lots of care and feeding uh, to make sure that uh, things are always running very smoothly. Now, uh, in our case, we run uh, various web applications, and the database that backs those web applications, if it, has anyone ever used Zope in the room? I've got a few people. OK, so the default storage for Zope is a large file system based file, and that file can get very big. When you go to file, file level backups, that whole file changes. Yeah, every day. Actually, it's changing every time the transaction happens in the database. So for us, every night's backups of the incrementals would always include the largest file in the whole system, which is typically that big database file, which is a pain in the butt. Uh, makes for very inefficient uh, use of our disk space for the backups and a very slow uh, for reading and writing that, that giant file when maybe only a couple hundred K of that file may have even changed, but then we're backing up a whole many, many, maybe ten, tens, if not hundreds of gigabyte single file. Uh, that's not to say that our application was you know, perfect uh, and could have been improved on, but because of our specific use case, this was very, very slow. 
Yeah, so we have to slow the backup part. Uh, it does leverage a file daemon on every box. So if you're running backup, you will install a file daemon on every uh, client machine that you'd want to backup. And then there will be a director piece that actually tells a backup storage daemon to stream the data from the, the file daemon on the client back to the backup server or wherever you're storing, wherever you're either to tape or to some kind of disk storage. And to actually help uh, configure our Bacula, we ended up uh, creating sets of Python code to produce templates and actually would run you know, a set of scripts to generate our many thousands of lines of Bacula configuration each time a, a change had to be made. So I think that there has to be a better way. <clears throat> oh, funny enough, there might be a better way. Uh, what if, so this is like, when you start thinking outside the box and actually looking at what you really need for a backup solution, you have to kind of analyze the, the various options that are out there and find one that fits your specific needs best. And for us, because of this web application that we, we typically develop or deploy to, having a block level uh, <clears throat> a block level backup is pretty critical to us being able to do efficient and fast backups and making sure that they always happen. Uh, but what if there was a file system that supported some of these advanced features we were looking for? Now, for example, snapshots, replication, compression, uh, kind of built-in data integrity. Um, I think something like this exists, which is you know, exactly what we were looking for. And also, what if there was a way for all of our VMs and all of our jails to be backed up by a file system that supported that block-level block um, uh, changes and in incremental uh, snapshotting and, and replication? All right, and did them at a block level. Did I mention block level? That's really important to us. Uh, given that we were FreeBSD and we, we love ZFS, this is a natural fit. Uh, so we have been using FreeBSD. And it was nice is that ZFS actually is cross-platform. So depending on whether we had like maybe a Solaris, or we, at some point we did have uh, SmartOS, OpenSolaris, uh, FreeBSD, I don't think we ever had Linux running with uh, ZFS, but that's actually quite stable now um, from the, some of the work that's been done. But it's nice because then it works cross-platform. We can actually use the same solution across all those various OSs. And actually, we were able to, to greatly simplify how we were doing our backups. Uh, for the goals, and, and these kind of just apply anytime you're setting up and trying to figure out how to accomplish your, your backup tasks, is it has to be reliable. We have to make sure that you know, we can ensure that it runs, and if it, there's errors in the process that we get, you know, obviously a report or someone gets alerted to go fix the issues that are happening. Uh, it needs to be granular. We need to be able to get down to a specific VM or a specific you know, file directory and be able to restore a file quickly from, uh, from that backup, especially if it's that large database file. Now, uh, we really care about integrity. Uh, how many people who are running, who have been on a Mac for any amount of time, have run into the uh, wonderful HFS Plus silent uh, file uh, bit rot? Yeah, this has bitten me. Uh, I'm actually running, you know, prior to the High Sierra, uh, ZFS on my laptop exactly for those reasons. Uh, so I use Mac or Open ZFS on Mac. I've been very happy with it, and the integrity issues are awesome. Uh, so I, you know, to kind of use it on my Mac. We also use it in all of our all of our infrastructure. Another key piece here is having few dependencies. I want as little as possible to have to touch the VMs or the jails, so they know as little about the backup process uh, than they need to, and it needs to be easy to configure. And then, obviously, at the very end, it runs with little care and feeding. So when moving over to using ZFS for our backup solution, uh, the first and initial win we got was obviously going to be uh, ease of use and simplicity of configuration. So this is on our Bacula setup. Uh, these are the amount of configuration lines that are required to back up. Uh, I think we've got probably like 300 hosts or 200 hosts uh, inside this. And you can see here we're well over 1,000 uh, lines of configuration to uh, manage that backup. And if you weren't using some kind of automated scripting to produce this, this is very tedious and very possible, you know, very error prone, and which led into our issues with Bacula being the config getting out of date and us basically getting down to like one backup a week. So every server that has to be backed up will have to have the Bacula FD process. So every server has this 27 line configuration file. And then the director has the others, uh, you can see there, the, the regular like scheduler and jobs files. 
So we had to have, again, some way of managing this process, and we had written a bunch of custom Python to be able to, to do this for us. But again, that falls out of, out of repair, disrepair quickly. When moving into using ZFS for our new backup solution, instead of having every specific, every VM and every jail running the Bacula file daemon, uh, we changed our, or shifted how we did that. Uh, instead of doing it at the client level, every client backing up, we then took every jail host and every beehive host and actually backed them up at the, at the hypervisor or uh, jail host level which again greatly simplifies things because you, know, you may have 30, 40 jails running on one machine, you may have uh, 10 to 15 virtual machines on one machine. Now we're down to configuring one, one set of configurations instead of like 15 or 30 per machine, which is nice. Uh, so this is on the jail host, for example. We use a combination of uh, ZFS snap and ZXFer to do the, uh, the snapshot management and then the replication. Uh, what's nice about ZFS Snap and the, those tools specifically is that they are they have very few dependencies. Uh, most of them are just shell scripts that work uh, cross-platform. Uh, the ZFS Snap works on my Mac just as well as it works on FreeBSD, which is nice. But to enable that, uh, the snapshot management, uh, you just have to add a couple lines to your periodic.conf, and from there, uh, you basically enable it, tell it which uh, recursive file systems you want to grab, and then it, it manages it all from there. Uh, this configures daily and weekly. Uh, you can actually go down to other granularities, but for us, that was enough to satisfy our, our promise to our customers of how much we would retain for them for their data usage. And then, so that's on the, um, so every, uh, every jail at every Beehive host has this in it now. And then on every trusted server, so like for example, the hypervisor servers are considered trusted because we don't have clients logging into them, uh, we would use ZXFer to send back the incremental snapshots. So in CronTab, there's one line, and that handles sending all the snapshots. So Z, as Z snap, ZFS snap creates the snapshots, uh, ZXFer on a once a day process will send them all back to our FreeNAS servers. Uh, so they're all running uh, jail, or we're all running the uh, FreeNAS for our storage uh, architecture on the back end. And I'll show you some cool stuff we've done with the, the FreeNAS stuff later. But what's nice here, this is pretty easy to configure. Um, actually, Alan is the kind of somewhat maintainer of, uh, of ZXFer. Uh, but it doesn't, re it doesn't require a lot. And it's very simple, very straightforward. You know, it can delete snapshots on the destination. It can force rollbacks of file systems in case it wasn't kind of ready to receive the uh, snapshots for some reason. Uh, what else is in here? It's interesting. And then the recursive data sets. So yeah, with one line, we're sending them back everything to the uh, servers. Now any server where we didn't necessarily trust the host, like maybe we did have uh, some bare metal, uh, virtual, or bare metal hardware servers hosted for customers, we don't want to put our keys you know, on that host that could access our storage server. So instead we kind of flip the, w the direction. We would pull from that uh, bare metal host back to the FreeNAS server instead of pushing from the servers back into FreeNAS. So in this case, it's just a you know, simple SSH send receive, you know, SSH into the remote host and then send the uh, receive back into the, the uh, FreeNAS server. And that was just mostly it because we didn't want to have our potentially private keys on some remote, who knows what server. So this is on the, uh, the FreeNAS side of things. We basically have a cron job that will run that, uh, this script right here. So we just basically use the scheduling you know, right through the GUI so any admin can very easily uh, set up and add in new machines if they need to or you know, manage the, the various scheduled jobs that are inside of FreeNAS. Now what's nice is you get a bonus if you're using FreeNAS. <coughs> Uh, who's running FreeNAS in production right now? Okay, so you guys are all should be well aware of this. Uh, FreeNAS has, I mean, we have multiple data center locations, and it's very easy to do off-site backups. So if you guys haven't done this, uh, if you should, definitely should check out, check out the replication tasks area of FreeNAS. Uh, basically, it's super easy to now set up uh, remoting that data off-site to another FreeNAS machine and running in some other data center. Uh, all with you know, one line through the GUI, you basically set up uh, a schedule and point it at a data set, and then it can now send those things off-site. So as, as kind of an added benefit to certain customers who wanted to kind of upsell into 
uh, off-site backups of their data, it's very easy for us to just now come in and add one line per customer who wants to have that off-site feature enabled. Then very easy for the admins to, to manage and maintain. Uh, so this presentation is online in my GitHub, uh, my email, and my Twitter. So if anybody has any questions, I am happy to answer them. No questions? All right, Dan. Instead of cron jobs, have you considered uh, let's say periodic? Uh, we, yes. So we do for part of it using the ZFS snap stuff, but I've not actually like you know formalized that more. <laughs> and you can, you can also enable and disable it with nrc.com penetration. True. Yeah, so I, I agree that that's definitely a better way to go to add use periodics uh, for the scheduling. Like in cron.d? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah, so we use, and so all of our servers are uh, configuration managed by salt. And so we actually just have that as part of the, the default you know, salt profile. When a machine's brought up, this stuff just gets put in place automatically. Like, luckily, there's no humans involved, typically, in getting any of this running. So new machines are automatically snapshotting and sending data uh, back the day one. Oh, yeah. I'm surprised I didn't mention that in my notes here. Uh, the Bacula backups uh, were getting to a point where they were taking longer than 24 hours sometimes. Uh, so we would have trouble basically doing them daily. Uh, that's what led us to the, the kind of bad situation. We did get it down to, say, like four, 14 to 15 hours for a backup uh, as before we switch over to ZFS. And when they switch over to ZFS, it now backs up the same set of servers. I mean, once you've got the initial base backups and all the base um, snapshots sent over to the storage server, the new uh, runs only take a couple hours, like maybe an hour or two to run through all of our infrastructure and send the incremental snapshots. So it's tremendously faster and, and saves a lot more space on data. <laughs> all right. Oh, for us, between the data centers, it's a 100 meg line. But not, not every, cut, not every uh, data set gets sent across to the, the remote data center. Uh, we only offsite for customers who you know, want that ex extra feature and then also just for our stuff. Yeah, go ahead. We did not. So I'm not actually I'm not even familiar with that. Is that the commercial? Okay. Precisely because of uh, because of this. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, for us, the simplicity it was a bigger win than almost the politics and the commercial licensing pieces of it. Uh, how have restores been going? <laughs> well, luckily we don't have to restore very often, uh, but the restores are easy. Uh, you you go into either the machine and send receive something back, or typically it's one file. Somebody's like, oh, I messed up a single file. And so we can actually, from the FreeNAS machine, just log in, CD into the, the specific snapshot directory and, and grab the file, you know, right off the, right off the file system. Correct. Now we have to, you have to clone it and mount that clone if you want to like go in and get the data, but yeah. We do. Yeah, it's all. It's just all. All put back on the on the FreeNAS system. What do you do about cleaning up old snapshots? <laughs> so the old snapshots get cleaned up automatically from the zexfer uh, command. It will delete. Um, well, as Z, as zfs snap takes the snapshots, it cleans them up on the client's side, and then on the server side, the zexfer deletes them if they don't exist on the destination. So from the client to the FreeNAS box.
Right, so we keep we were keeping uh, monthlies for a year, and then weeklies for I can't remember what the time frame was. That's all configurable via the ZFS now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. And so you can control the grandfathering with the, the dash C slash. Yeah, probably my probably my biggest issue with you know snapshot management is the fact that ZFS is too good and it's hard to delete data if I needed to because of like if there was some kind of legality and someone required me to delete some kind of backup, I'm gonna have a hard time actually with that. Huh. More data heads. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, and I liked your suggestion during the BOF or the ZFS talk the other day was to encrypt those data sets, have encrypted data sets, and so basically the deletion process is throw away that key. And I think that's a good idea for now. So one of my big fears with replicating snapshots where you propagate the deletion from the source, there's been cases where I've accidentally deleted snapshots from the source and I wouldn't want those propagated to the, uh, to the backup. Uh, if they disappear in both, it kind of defeats the point, so I'm glad there's a grandfathering thing there. But I would rather have a minimum sort of time before things go away as well. Yeah, actually, the I would like to keep. I would like to guarantee keeping at least the last 24 hours worth in case a certain idiot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. It should be pretty easy to add. Yeah. Um, although the next talk is. I was going to say the next talk. I think is really maybe really relevant. <laughs> it works very well. I must. I must well, admit. Yeah. No. no. no the, the next, actually, I talked to the, the next speaker about his ZREPL, and it seems to be a much more like formalized system around the snapshot and replication uh, management piece, which I was not, it's brand new and he's kind of the only one using it right now, but I was very interested in actually picking that up and starting to use it as well, because I think it may complement our set of tools really well. Uh, now, the only thing I don't like about it is it adds in more complexity. Like this is already very, very simple and does accomplish the job. But if I can improve upon it by, you know, and the value is there in that improvement, then it's worth doing. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the question is like, yeah, the question is how do we go about protecting against, say, a rogue system in or some kind of human error with an offline copy of the data? Um, right now, we just have the off-site, you know, but it's not offline. Like, it could, that could very easily propagate, you know, some fat fingering across to the, the disaster recovery center. Yeah, there's the, the two cases that something blows up, that's fine, but mm -hmm. malicious or accident. Hmm. The replica, the offset replica is always exactly X days behind. Uh, so that no matter what happens over there, we don't propagate it until it's old. Yeah, so I don't, I don't currently have an offline you know, solution for that right now. I mean, one of the things so we do. Is just have an, uh, the offset replica only be online to replicate and it goes offline. To, it's only on, <laughs> once, it only catches up once a week, so it's always going to be a week behind. Yeah. I mean, for us, it is more important that we had the offsite had more up to date data, though, too. Yeah. In my case, it's trying to keep the replica as close to real time as possible. Yeah. Purposely for my information. Mm -hmm. It might be valuable in having the option to have a third copy that's purposely delayed. Well, that's something we've thought about is that at the, at the offsite center, having a second FreeNAS box there that, that they do to the replica, it drops the data down, like, say, on a, on a very specific schedule. So you have that protection of an additional copy there. Have you or anyone here looked at, say, two-factor authentication or even secure level to prevent the deletion of snapshots? I haven't. And that's actually uh, 
one of the things that I, like, one of them, I don't know, not a problem, but like one of my issues with ZFS is it's very easy and very quick to destroy. Uh, there's not even there's not even an ask you like if you care to destroy it. It's just you you've just destroyed it and it's very efficient. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. But uh, <laughs> right, I should almost at least that on every machine then. <laughs> Try. <laughs> True. It's very it's very easy to destroy uh, things on ZFS. Uh, what I, I have not looked, but once you destroy it, there's not like a I can get it back type thing. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> the snapshots, yes, yeah, true. Which I have lots of snapshots, which is very nice. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm not uh, at this point. It's very, very difficult to get rid of data in this setup. Uh, luckily, you know, cross your fingers. Right. So, so I don't even know like how we could go about that. Like, because we we have. Which, which is what we have. We, we do have one data set for every individual customer, because every customer has either a VM or a jail, and all the jails are, uh, each, each of them have their own data sets. So if a specific customer came to us and said, we need to, we need to have our data deleted, then yes, I can destroy all of those data sets related to their, just their data. Sorry, if they have a subset of their data, that's, that's, your only option is making a new VM, copies good stuff, and delete the Right, that's probably exactly what I had to do, because I, I it's just the data stays around. Then you can put data sets. Yeah. I mean, the data sets are cheap, so use them you know, all over the places, which is nice. Yeah. The way, the way that I clean out unwanted data from backup snapshots is that I clone the, I, I make a writable clone of the snapshot, then I eliminate what I don't want in there. You have to do that for every snapshot that the data is in. And then you delete the originals, snapshot, <laughs> Yeah, so what you're saying it's possible to make a writable clone, delete the file, but you have to do this for every snapshot you would have. Could we, you know, we potentially have hundreds or thousands of snapshots. I was gonna say that that sounds like it's calling out screaming for automation. <laughs> Yeah. So you can just run a kind job on all the snapshots and you get the list of snapshots that contain the I mean, they take forever, but uh, actually, it's probably not that bad. That's actually one of my favorite features of ZFS is the .zfs directory. Oh, pipe it to tar. Yeah, so the question was how do you get ZFS data sets down to tape? And you can just 
string it down to tape the send. <laughs> yes, it's true. ZFS has made our lives too easy. Yes, Michael. Are you using strictly LZ4? Sorry, LZ4. Are you, have you ever attempted deduplication and have it suited you? I've never attempted deduplication. Uh, we've had enough storage that it's not been an issue, and we are using LZ4. Nothing unusual? Not that I've ever noticed, no. Is there something I should be aware of with LZ4? <laughs> yeah, well, something new coming, but... Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the new stuff Alan exactly. was talking about. Yeah, and that, that I'm actually quite excited about. Um, so I'm happy to switch when the time, the time comes. Yes? Um, have you had any issues? It sounds like uh, Zoopeats is mostly a flat file database. Have you had any cases where there's a process that's caching things heavily into memory and doesn't flush it off and reach it? Um, where you so the question is if we've run into an issue where something is maybe not flushing down the disk as, as aggressively as, as we'd like uh, with the application. It's not actually an issue with Zope. I mean, now we're getting more into a Zope discussion specifically. Zope is an append-only database. And it, on start, will tr automatically trim any corrupted transactions from the end of the database as it starts. So you can very reliably uh, snapshot that, that file at any point in time. Uh, even uh, if a power outage happened or whatever, it's it's very very resilient to uh, to starting back up and and basically rolling back whatever failed transactions might have been on the end of it. So for that, we've just benefited because the, that's the nature of that application. If you have other databases where you want to ensure consistency, like you know Postgres or MySQL, I mean you should definitely have probably an additional cron jobs and in those cron jobs maybe to do some kind of a start backup, stop backup uh, type thing. <laughs> That I don't know. And I think it's definitely a question for the row right in front of you. Okay, so the, the question is about the zil flushing on, but it happens automatically when you do when you do a snapshot. And since you only send snapshots, you have the whole data set. Always be consistent. I love that. I've only had a request like that once uh, where we had customer data we shouldn't have had and it was in subversion. And so I had to filter it out of every subversion transaction to undo it, but I didn't have it on, uh, did we have it on tape? We probably did, but we were using Bacula at the time. Yeah. Or Bacula would have attended to that for you. <laughs> legally can be no we can't do that uh, if you are able to alter the media you aren't allowed to say no we can't do that so, that's so you choose your media carefully <laughs> this is yet to be tested this is an unofficial opinion that we've been told verbally but that's something you might explore through your legal team because almost all the legislation around the world allowing this does have some exemptions for where it is not technically possible to delete the data. Could be some optical media or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So couldn't you get into like a semantics thing if you have a checksum stream? Absolutely. That, that's not blockchain backups. Right. Blockchain. <laughs> and then that's for, you know, That'll be next year's presentation. <laughs> 
there are ways to, you know, do this that don't so shoot yourself in the foot. And that's like the logical extreme of like one database per customer. Like if you've got Kinda. one database for every individual in Europe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the European law situation is, but this is under Canadian law. Now, who in the room has gotten a notice to delete data? Okay. It's coming. Well, not under GDPR, but under pre Oh, actually, I'm sorry that, yeah. <laughs> we had we have a season this. Yeah. And do you have to go, you've gone all the way back through the backups of that? Case, not the backups. Yeah. What, in that case, at the time, it was what backups, but. It was, it was. Like CV yeah, it was yeah. Globally, globally distributed backups at the time. That's, that's the official story. I'm sorry, the official line. <laughs> but, yeah, so they do happen, and yeah. And it's, I, I expect it's going to get far more common once people. Yeah, this, this, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of worried about this because we do write applications that are portals where people log in and have a profile, and I don't know how to reliably say I've gotten rid of all your data. Like, there'll be these remnants. Or I can say, I don't know, with GDPR, do you have the time frame with which you have to guarantee it's all gone? It's complicated, not a lawyer. Yep. There's a lot of good write ups on it. We hear on all cases talk to a lawyer. Talk to a lawyer. Yeah, so talk to a lawyer is our answer. Almost makes you wonder if they didn't make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you all very much.